to open our event this evening as soon as all of you who are getting seconds have gotten your seconds. So if any of you are thinking, oh, I want to do that, this is a great moment to do that, and we'll start in another minute or two. session of our Scientists in Synagogues monthly seminar, My How Time Flies. Um, is this the first session for any of you who are attending? All right, welcome. Glad you could make it tonight. Um, so the format of our session is uh, I usually introduce the speaker with a brief text study from Jewish sources. Um, that reflects some facet, some element of what the speaker will be discussing. And then the speaker has sort of a half hour to 45 minutes, you know, flexible, how much uh, he or she wants to lecture. And then we'll open for questions and usually I'll ask the lead question. And we do ask, especially tonight because we are recording this, that folks will hold their questions until they are speaking into a microphone. Um, but we will get started. So I invite you to turn to the text sheets that are on the table and join me in the brief study. So we are discussing tonight why this is not the language that uh, Professor Elliot Berkman has put on the topic, but why is teshuva so difficult? What, in the sense that, you know, like we know that there's something in our lives that we maybe want to change, and we even, you know, intend to change it, and yet so often we still wind up on Yom Kippur noting that we've done the same things that we said we were going to stop doing last Yom Kippur, to put it simply. So, um, this is certainly a question that is quite live in Jewish tradition, and I'm going to bring one strand of answer to the question that uh, appears over and over again, as you will see. So um, I invite you to say the blessing for Torah study with me, if you would like. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kitshanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivan la'asok b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, eternal and sovereign of the universe, who makes us holy through mitzvot, including the mitzvah of engaging with words of Torah. Welcome, you are welcome to get some food and sit down and join the study. So our first earliest text is from the Mishnah, from the oral, the compendium of oral law, redacted circa 225 CE. And there's this very pithy phrase that our Talmud Torah students sing in music time, mitzvah goreret mitzvah, avera goreret avera. One mitzvah leads to another mitzvah, and one transgression leads to another transgression. And, and then this is interesting, shishar mitzvah mitzvah uschar avera avera, for the reward, the payoff of a mitzvah, is presumably, this is saying, the opportunity to do more mitzvot. You know, maybe once you get a reputation for doing mitzvot, people will send more mitzvot your way. And schar avira, the reward of a transgression is another transgression, or is the opportunity to transgress further. And before we look further at these texts, um, does anyone want to reflect on what this might mean? Because I'm not sure what it what it means. What I think there's a lot of um, potential meanings of what they could be saying about schar avira avira, the reward of a transgression, the payoff of a transgression is another transgression. I would 
guess perhaps uh, the reward for transgression is like paving the road and it makes it easier to travel on. Ah, so Chuck says one transgression sort of is a paving stone in a road towards further transgression. Maybe. That is definitely the perspective that we'll see in the next text. But maybe we'll keep our minds open to other possibilities. In the Talmud Arachim, 30, page 30b, and uh, Talmud was redacted in around 550 CE, this, uh, this comment shows up in the context of talking about someone who has transgressed a particular principle. In this case, it is the principle of not borrowing or lending at usury. And this person, and it's actually a mitzvah not to take out a, a usurious loan, interestingly. Not to take out a loan at interest. Not a mitzvah that most people, you know, anybody who is has a mortgage nowadays is following, but um, but the the Talmud in the midst of this discussion about how well if you start out taking out one loan and then you can't repay it, you're going to take out more loans and more loans until you've mortgaged away everything and until you functionally have to like sell yourself into slavery. When the Talmud's talking about slavery, it's not chattel slavery as we as we construe it. It's you know being a bondsman to someone until you can pay off your debts. Anyway, that's a little, uh, that's just the context. But um, they, they then say this is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Huna. For Rabbi Huna said, and this is what you have on your sheet, once a man has committed a transaction and repeated it, it is permitted to him. And then the Talmud, the Talmudic editorial voice responds, what does that mean, permitted to him? That, that can't be. There's no such thing as a transgression becoming permitted just because you've done it. Um, say, rather, it becomes in that person's own mind as if it is permitted to him. And then Rashi, who is our sort of most comprehensive, authoritative commentator on the, on the Talmud, further explicates becomes as if permitted in that person's own perspective, as if permitted. At first, when they only have transgressed once, the text states the word felt, and this is that larger context that you don't have in front of you, that like they, they feel the pain of what they are doing, which implies that she or he knew and internalized that she or he was transgressing, but did not recoil from the transgression and, and nonetheless did it. But the second time, and as they go on and on, the text states they have no opportunity, that is, no opportunity to think twice, no opportunity to repent, for it doesn't even register internally as a sin. So once we, become, once we get used to doing something, even if we know intellectually it's wrong, there is some aspect of our internal self-checking mechanisms that break down according to this Talmudic view that make it really difficult for us to stop. Um, and I think the Talmud is not, is not just talking about addiction specifically, but about any sort of habit that we might get into, the ways that we justify ourselves to ourselves and to those around us. And I don't know about you, but I'm very curious to see how Professor, um, oh, um, <laughs> sorry, Professor Elliot Berkman's studies in psychology will inform the Talmudic uh, position, will di diverge from the Talmudic position. Um, my apologies, Elliot. As you know, it's been a long day. So without further talking on my part, I invite Professor Elliot Berkman to share his perspectives on why is it so hard for us to change? Thank you. Hey. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me, Ruthie. Rabbi Ruthie was, was telling me that she took the 7 a.m. flight from New York to get here today. I've been on that flight. That's an early, I mean, it's almost a 24-hour that you're awake, so I'm amazed that you're even on your feet. So thank you very much. That was really interesting. It made me even more excited to, to talk to you guys. The setup was absolutely perfect because um, as I talked about today, uh, 
this is the title of my talk. I'll, I'll introduce myself in a minute, but I wanted to make the connection to what, to what Rabbi Ruhi was saying right away, because I think it's so clear. So tonight, um, what we'll, we'll learn, first of all, is why, I'll start by saying, why is this so hard? And um, I apologize if I turn around, I can't quite see my slides. Um, so the first thing is, why is it so hard to change behavior? Um, which is exactly the topic that you've queued up so nicely. Why is it that once we engage in a behavior, whether it be a mitzvah or whether it be sinful, that it, it sort of begets that same behavior over, over and over? Why is it hard to get out of those ruts? Um, I'll talk about, uh, what else? We'll talk about science. Uh, we've done quite a bit of science um, in my lab, but I won't, won't even focus on it. The, the work that my lab has done in this topic is such a small part of the knowledge that, that sort of the scientific community has put together. I'll highlight some of these um, uh, kind of behavior change strategies that scientists have identified. I'll tell you about instant habits. I'll explain what that is and how they work. Um, I'll talk about social influences on behavior change, and that's a topic that I think, uh, I, I would guess, um, the Torah has, has quite a bit to say um, on this topic of how we can help each other, that behavior change, um, one of these insights that psychology would probably regard as relatively new, but I'm guessing is, is quite ancient, which is that behavior change doesn't happen just in an individual, but it's something that happens at the level of relationships, families, and communities. Um, we can, uh, I'll talk about this idea of self-concept and identity, um, the way that, the, literally the way we think of ourselves, who, the, that, the way that I think of who I am, my self-concept, and how that can inform behavior change. And if there's any time left at all, we can, I can sort of uh, pontificate a little bit about the future directions, and I can tell you about some ongoing work in our lab. Um, but I do want to note that this is meant to be a conversation, so if, Anything I say is confusing or sparks questions, I'm, I'm really happy to entertain them as we go. I have no compelling need to get through all these slides. Um, so yeah, so just a little context, I said I would introduce myself. So I'm Melia Berkman, I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. I'm not the only professor of psychology in the room even. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's other people here. Um, and, uh, but the work in my lab focuses on this area um, specifically, we, we say that we study goals, motivation, and, and behavior change. So how is it that we set goals for ourselves? How do we motivate ourselves to, to pursue those goals? Um, and ultimately, how do we change our behavior if we think humans? Okay, so the first question is, um, what is, you know, this concept of self-control? Meaning, you know, how do you kind of direct your behavior um, towards the, your better self, right? If you have some you know, delicious treat that you want on a kind of impulsive level or hedonic level, but you, you have some long-term goal, like, you know, to eat less sugar or to, to exercise more. How do we kind of promote those kinds of better self type behaviors um, over the more impulsive ones? And um, the, the answer, I mean, there are many ways of approaching that, but from my perspective, um, what I want to impress on you is that the psychology and, the, in fact, the neuroscience of this um, it's quite clear that our brains are designed to form habits. Um, I think habits kind of generally get a bad rap. When we think of habits, I think we think of bad habits by default. But in general, they're quite adaptive. Um, and so I'll, I'll just, I'm, I won't show you too many pictures of brains today. A lot of the work in my lab uses neuroscientific methods such as functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is what, what you're looking at here. Um, but the point of this slide is just to say that at this point, it's fairly well characterized at the level of the brain which systems are involved in creating habits and maintaining habits, um, how that shifts over time. So how, for example, when you take that first step by engaging in a mitzvah, um, and then, it, then the next step, engaging in a mitzvah again, becomes more likely. And actually over time, that, that sort of path, uh, that entrenchment, that, that habit pathway becomes more and more entrenched at the level of the brain. So there's different ways of studying this. It's, it's characterized extremely uh, precisely in animal models. Um, we can use animals, and it's pretty easy to get animals to form habits to do things by rewarding them. Um, and animals have this advantage that we can really, you know, very literally peek under the hood in terms of what's going on in the brain. But technologies like fMRI allow us to look into the brains of kind of 
human beings without opening up their heads, which is a really lovely uh, advantage of that technology. Um, and so essentially what you have here is people planning um, to engage in something. And um, you see these activation in this brain region. It's um, the, what we might call the, the superior uh, uh, sorry, uh, ganglia, um, basal ganglia, so very part of that. Uh, and what happens, so one thing to note about this region, first of all, is that it's very phylogenetically old, meaning it's an ancient brain region. It's not part of our kind of prefrontal cortex. It's not part of the neocortex that's evolved more recently. It's actually quite ancient. It's one of the, the brain systems that's been preserved across evolution. And what you see is as people learn to do something, and importantly, as the behavior gets rewarded, that's kind of the key kind of recipe for habits, is a behavior and a reward. Um, the brain system shift in terms of which parts of the basal ganglia are controlling the behavior. I won't, again, I won't go into the, the kind of details of the neuroscience. It's been worked out well, and it's actually pretty, pretty clever the way it works. But it works the same way in humans as it does in, in rats. Um, almost exactly, it's almost the same architecture at the neural level. Um, and so, you know, as we worked this kind of system out here, we have different, you know, anterior striatum, superior, uh, anterior, posterior. So at first, what you have is a cue that triggers a behavior. That cue gets paired with activity in the brain region. Um, and it gets, the, the reward kind of reinforces this. So neurotransmitters such as dopamine, are quite involved in this pathway that, that sort of gluing together in memory a behavior and a reward, right? That's sort of the, the core function of this circuit. As I do something, it gets rewarded, I remember the context where engaging in this behavior caused a reward. And from an evolutionary perspective, that's incredibly adaptive, right? If, if I know that I took a certain path to find an apple tree, and I knew that there were good apples there, you're gonna wanna remember that. Right? And, and our brain has a mechanism to do that. And over time, what, what is kind of clever but also can be kind of insidious about this system is that eventually the control passes between these two subregions of the striatum. It goes from the anterior to the posterior. And then over time, you don't necessarily need the reward to be present every time. You know, this part of, of the brain can trigger behavior even in the absence of reward. It's kind of the essence of how the habit learning system works. It's rewarded and then this behavior gets passed off and it becomes habitual. Which I think is just exactly what Rabbi Ruhi just said um, earlier in kind of neuroscientific terms. This is why any kind of behavior, to the extent that it gets rewarded, right? If I commit a mitzvah and it, and it feels good, it's rewarding to, you know, to do a mitzvah, then that's going to become more likely over time. But likewise, if I do something bad, right, um, and we can construe all different ways of bad things, right, those can be rewarding too, and will just, just the same become self-reinforcing. So I want to emphasize the reason that our brains do this and that our brains have, have done this for a long time is because habits aren't necessarily bad. Um, they're quite powerful um, because they're efficient. What's nice about behavior being re rewarded and reinforced is that over time, it becomes what we would call automatic. This behavior is something that we can engage in without really thinking, mindless behavior, right? Any kind of habits are usually mindless. They're not something that you need to put much effort in to engage in. And that's pretty adaptive um, for, for a species that has uh, hu humans, um, a pretty exquisite ability to, to focus and to think really complex, abstract thoughts. Um, but that ability is really kind of feeble. The, the, the fact is that we can only really focus on maybe one thing at a time. Some of us can't even focus on one thing at a time. But you know, at, at best, right, we can really focus on one thing at a time. And why that is is kind of an interesting thing. I mean, maybe it's the property of our visual system, right? There are literally, you know, there's a part of our eye, you know, our retina, the fovea, that can focus with high detail, the rest of it is blurry, right? And our mind kind of works like that too. When you attend to something, you can give it your full attention, but then everything else sort of fades into the background. And as a, as a property of that, our minds are, uh, are, are, are sort of, our ability to focus on things in a really careful, deliberate way operates in a serial manner, meaning we have to do things one at a time, right? If I'm doing hard mental math, when I'm working on my taxes, 
I mean, we have some accountants in the room, right? I'm not doing other things, right? You can all, I can do taxes, which actually is pretty amazing, right? Our humans in general, we can do amazing things, right? We can read, we can do Torah study. But when you're doing those things, you really can't be doing other things at the same time. You can't, you can't operate in parallel. You're only operating in serial. And so the idea of habits is that they, they're kind of evolution's trick. It's evolution's way of enabling us to do more than one thing at a time. Because once we overlearn something, once, once a behavior becomes habitual, then it no longer needs to occupy that precious you know, phobia space. It no longer needs to occupy that, that very limited attention. Right? Just like maybe if you think back to when you first learned to drive, when you learn to drive, it's very hard at first. You need to focus on where to put your feet, right, and where your hands go and how far you need to turn your hands to get the car to go the way you want to go. Once you learn it, of course, then you can do it without thinking. And we can sing along to the radio while driving at the same time. Right? It's not a problem. So driving relies on the habit system just the same way that eating home intoxication, right, and becoming addicted to drugs, and, and really the very same way. That once, you, once you've done it a few times, it becomes effortless, and that, that's very efficient. So, habits rely on this kind of association between a cue, you know, usually something like seeing a food, uh, or, you know, seeing a, a red light or a yellow light, right? We know that that's going to trigger this behavior of putting your foot on the brake. So, how do you kind of overcome this? Right? What happens when there's a behavior that's become entrenched in this habit learning system that we'd rather not? Right? I don't necessarily want to overcome my habit of driving. I don't want to overcome my habit of putting my foot on the brake pedal when I see a yellow light. But sometimes, you know, maybe I want to overcome my habit of, of going to you know, Voodoo Donuts every time I walk by there. Um, and so, science has come up with a few hacks. I mean, one of them is what uh, my colleague at, the, at NYU and Peter Goldwitzer calls instant habits. He says, well, we can try to, to kind of get people to create those pairs between a cue and a behavior. Uh, just in the same way that habits are formed, you can create habits a little more quickly and, and kind of use, use the same system for good. That would be one way. So he calls those implementation intentions. Um, we can use social pressure. As I mentioned, there's, there's lots of things in the world that are rewarding. I mean, obviously, you know, often the habits that we want to break, like being sedentary or eating, you know, too much desserty kind of food, uh, rely on on sort of primary rewards, right? Things like, you know, low effort tasks or sugar, right? Money maybe a secondary reinforcer. Um, but there's other rewards that are, are just as good, sometimes actually better in terms of how powerfully they act on our brains, um, and. The social world is one of them. Uh, things like social approval, uh, kind of almost conformity, or sort of fitting in with a social group is pretty powerfully rewarding to us as humans because we're, we're social creatures. Um, you may have heard this, this notion. Uh, my, my field within psychology is known as social psychology, and it's really all about the power of the social world to, to motivate behavior and behavior change. Um, and then we can motivate yourself using your yourself there. What I mean by that in, in italics, the self in italics refers to this idea of your self-concept, of how you think of yourself. Um, one of the things that's really kind of unpleasant to us, uh, this famous psychologist named Leon Festinger identified this experience of what he called cognitive dissonance. Um, maybe you've heard of this, but one of the, the things that really triggers cognitive dissonance is essentially hypocrisy, noticing when your behavior doesn't line up with your, your expectations of yourself or your internal standards. You know, if I think of myself as a healthy person and I catch myself going to voodoo donuts, right, or having you know, too, many, too many beers in the evening, and I know that that's not healthy, then Leon Festinger's idea is, well, that's gonna, once, once I become aware of that, Kind of hypocrisy, that inconsistency, that's going to cause dissonance, and I'm going to be motivated to reduce that dissonance. Um, and one, one way would be to change behavior. So we'll talk about that um, idea of motivating self-concept as a force for change, if we have time. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little about instant habits. Um, so really these are quite simple. Uh, they're, they're simple if-then plans. And I'll tell you, that's the structure of them. So you want a condition, and then a behavior. If is the condition, 
and then the then is the behavioral part. Um, and the idea here is really, it's modeled after the habit learning system very, very deliberately. The idea is to create a link between a specific condition or context and a specific behavior. Um, so examples are things like this. Um, so this is common, actually. It's, a, it's a, an effective treatment for cigarette uh, cessation, smoking cessation, is to plan out how you're going to quit smoking, how you're going to change behavior. Um, and the plans would look something like this. So I know that I'm going to go into a situation, uh, you know, maybe I'll be going out with friends, and after dinner, somebody might offer me a cigarette. So I would say, if somebody offers me a cigarette, and the more specific you can be about the condition, the better. Right? So if somebody does this, then um, I will uh, say I'm trying to chew gum and cut back. Right? So that's an, an idea. And the idea here is it's almost to sort of preload these plans, um, relying on this concept, again, that our, our attentional scope is very, very limited. And when somebody puts you on the spot, right, by offering you something that you really want, right, cigarette in this case, for a smoker, um, it's going to be really hard to figure out kind of a way out of that, right, unless I have something already in mind that I can easily call up as like, here's how I'm going to handle that situation, right? Um, if I walk by Blue Star, it's my favorite donut place out in Portland, then um, I'll get a big cup of coffee instead, right? So plan that out, right? If I'm tempted to buy that tchotchke, right, I know there's always something on Amazon that I could buy, but no, nope, when, when I see that thing, whatever it is, I'm going to, you know, think about my kid's college fund and put money in there instead. So planning these things out in detail. Um, and I'll just show you some of the actual data. This is a fairly, um, it's actually one of the best cited papers on this topic. This is what is called a meta-analysis. So it's a study of studies. At this point, Peter Goldzer and his colleagues have done uh, many, many uh, dozens of studies on these kinds of simple implementation intentions where they bring subjects into the lab, they ask them what kinds of goals they have, and they randomly assign them to either create implementation intentions or to do some other kind of unrelated activity. Um, and then they track their, their performance on the goals. They see how well they actually follow through with their plans. Um, and it turns out that in general, um, implementation intentions are effective um, at many points in this kind of goal striving system. So it helps people get moving on their goals, so initiating goal settings, remembering to act, seizing opportunities as they arise, etc. Um, shields goal striving from unwanted influences. That's where it's sort of particularly strong. A lot of these effects are, are especially strong um, when you, your goal, you're sort of tempted by alternative behaviors. Um, and what I'm showing you here, so this column that's highlighted, this column that's labeled D, D is a, a, a statistic essentially that um, we refer to as an effect size, and it gives you a, a sense of roughly how kind of, how strong the effect is of this implementation intention manipulation. Um, and the kind of rubrics and rules of thumb here are that point 0.2 is a small effect, point 0.5 is a medium effect, and point 0.8 is a, is a large effect. Those are kind of the, the standards. Um, and so you can see a lot of these are, are quite high. They're at least medium, and some of them are you know, 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0.1. So these are large effects of implementation intentions on blocking detrimental cell states, you know, helping you attend, attend you know, direct your attention towards the things you want, disengaging from fuel goal striving. So in general, this is just evidence to say that consistently across a, a, different, a, a bunch of different points in the goal setting, goal striving process, implementations can be quite helpful. All right, well, that's, that's where I am. Gonna, should I just sort of pause and see if you guys have thoughts or reflections or questions? When I teach, I like to sort of break it up. I feel like I've been talking for too long. No. Okay, I'll go. I can continue. Okay, good. Um, so then, okay, so let's. So that was implementation intentions. It's a good little trick, and they're they're quite popular. Um, the the key limitation that some people have pointed to with implementation intentions is they're still very focused at the the level of the individual person. Right? And in general, this is one of the broad criticisms of, of academic psychology, as I understand it. And I'd be curious to hear if other people agree, but I mean, certainly one of the, the kind of characteristics of my field is our unit of analysis is the individual person, often. 
And there's some advantages of that. I mean, when you're dealing with neuroscience, it's, it makes sense, right? You can only look at one brain at a time, usually. Um, but when we're talking about something like goal setting or goal striving, you know, it, it sometimes actually takes, makes sense to broaden out and consider the unit of analysis maybe being, um, you know, a diet, a partner couple, a parent-child couple, a romantic couple, or maybe the unit of analysis is a family or a community. Um, and that's one of the more interesting directions that social psychology has, has started to go. It starts to be a little bit broader in its scope, almost merging with kind of sociology in, in some points. So different ways that other people can help us on our way to, to behavior change, on our path to, to learning new behaviors and sticking with them. Um, so one is uh, that we learn from each other. And not, not, I'm not talking just in a simple kind of pedagogical sense, but actually in a really profound, deep way. Um, our brains are, are built um, to learn from what other people do. We learn from other people's mistakes. We learn from other people's successes. And I'll, I'll illustrate how that works. We feel obligated to each other. Um, and again, I think this is an interesting topic from the perspective of, perspective of, of religion in general, and Judaism in, in particular, that that there's, there's a sense of social obligation to others. That when I make a commitment to do something, that's obligating myself, but it also sort of embeds myself in, a, in the community of people that I've made that commitment to. Um, and then we care about social norms. Um, this is harking back a little bit to, I mentioned Leon Festinger's idea of cognitive dissonance, and social norms play a pretty, pretty big role in that theory as well. That, when there's a standard, when there's an expectation of behavior in a certain context, it, it becomes hard to buck that trend. Um, my, one example of this in terms of social norms is there's all these little uh, kind of nudge-based manipulations. If you've stayed at a hotel, you might see a little card on the bed that says, you know, you can choose, if you want, you can choose to conserve water by hanging up your towels. Um, one of the most powerful ways to encourage people to change their behavior is to put a simple social norm on there. It says, most of our guests prefer to hang their towels on the hook to save water, right? And so there, it's kind of setting the social norm, right? Making that salient, making the fact that kind of what the nudge there is, is telling you is that, well, if you don't do this, then you're not really fitting in, right? You're, you're different. You're going to be different from other people. Um, it's also kind of an interesting example of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, some of the early studies of this, it was sort of before people really started caring about conserving water as a society. And so, objectively, it was, it was false. So if you placed a card on somebody's bed that said most of our guests prefer to do this, well, at first it was not true. But as people started to believe that other people wanted to do it, then they, they did start doing it. And so at some point, then it became true. Right? That's sort of the definition of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, so learning from each other. So um, one of the key things here about learning is that you, you learn from other people that you perceive to be similar to you and to be close to you. So we learn well from our families, we learn well from other people, our friends that we perceive to be close to us. Um, I could go on a tangent here about this idea of perceived similarity, uh, that a lot of work on psychology, and particularly the psychology of intergroup conflict, so for example, ethnic conflict, revolves around this idea of you know, we quite easily draw boundaries between groups of people, right? In group and out group. It's easy for us to sort of divide people up into groups. But, but, and, and when we do that, we perceive similarity. We perceive ourselves to be more similar to other people in our in group, and we perceive ourselves to be dissimilar from people in the other group. But that's sort of a psychological illusion, right? If we can define those boundaries bigger, right? If we can have more, you know, broader, more inclusive sets of people who we consider our in group, then all of a sudden you start to see similarities between yourself and other people that you didn't see before. Um, so, so the whole idea of similarity is, is kind of a psychological illusion, um, at least when it comes to social similarity. So what I'm showing you here is a study of uh, people's brain waves. So these squiggly lines here represent averages of brain activity um, in, I think this is the, uh, ERN. So this is probably right about here. So this is using this technology called electroencephalography. Um, and you put uh, electrodes on people's heads. Um, you can put lots of them. Uh, my, uh, I have um, colleagues uh, in the University of Oregon that do this quite a bit. Um, we, we have actually one of, our, one of our colleagues, Don Tucker, uh, created this company 
which was formerly known as electrical, electrogeodesics, maybe you've heard of it here in Eugene. Um, they've since been bought by, uh, by Philips, but he has actually developed a lot of the technology to measure this um, in a really kind of robust way, much more robust than was previously possible. Um, but anyway, these squiggly lines are, are measures of electrical activity. And one of the most consistent findings in that literature when you measure electrical activity is that when people make a mistake, when you make a mistake, so you're playing maybe a game, a computer game, and you know that sense of like, you push a button and you know you've pushed the wrong button, right? It's like, oh, you know, oh crap, I pushed the wrong button, right? That response is coded really robustly and very uh, kind of strongly. Um, and this is what's called the feedback related negativity. So FRN, feedback related negativity. And what's, what I love about this study is that what they're showing here is not that you have a feedback related negativity when you make a mistake. That is really well established. What this is showing is people who are they're wearing their EEG caps with all these electrodes all over their head, they're not even playing the game. This is people watching other people play the game. They're watching their friends play the game. Um, those are the, the darker lines. Or they're watching a stranger play the game. In both conditions, people are told, your job is to figure out how to play this game. So they're motivated. So it says, look, you're going to play it next, and you're going to get rewards for playing it well. Um, and the way you're going to learn is by watching these people play the game. And what's interesting here, probably you can see, right, in the, this dark kind of solid line here, this is watching your friends make a mistake. This is the signal, the condition that elicits the, the largest feedback-related negativity. And it's larger when your friends make a mistake than when your friends are correct. And that's great. That makes sense, actually, because you don't actually learn anything when you see somebody doing the right thing. Right? There's much more learning that happens when you see somebody making a mistake. Um, it's sort of like, have you guys ever heard Neil deGrasse, you know the show Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me? Um, I heard this episode of that where the physicist Neil deGrasse Tyson was on there. Um, and you know how they do that news quiz? And so he called in, and he got all, all three questions wrong. And another contestant, um, you know, got them all right. And they were the hosts were sort of making fun of them, and he and his response was, "No, you know, you should you should feel bad for her actually because I got all three questions wrong, which means I learned something today, um, right? You you learn from making a mistake. If you get all three questions right, it means you already knew the information. You're not learning anything, right? And and there's there's a truth to that that we learn more by making errors ourselves." But this is cool because we learn more by watching our friends make errors, and it's kind of important that there's a difference, a pretty big difference, between watching your friends make an error, somebody that you see as similar to you and that you like, compared to watching a stranger make an error. So here, I mean, to me this is kind of neat. It's the sense of like, when you learn, I learn. And it's not just watching anybody, you learn especially well when you're watching other people make mistakes. Which I, it's really neat. Um, and this idea of like, uh, increasing closeness to people, the, the more kind of close you perceive yourself to somebody psychologically, um, that increases your commitment to the goal. So there's this idea of like shared goals. Um, and I, I won't get into it right now, but there's this whole kind of little sub-literature on what are the conditions when romantic partners, usually they're studying romantic partners, kind of can facilitate each other's goal pursuit um, or their goal progress. And that there's, you know, if you're in a healthy relationship and your partner you know, wants to change their eating or exercise more, um, the most powerful thing you can do is, is to, to do it together. Um, and in fact, it actually usually undermines people's behavior change if their partner doesn't. So just a little example, in a lot of my research, we study cigarette smoking cessation. So we'll recruit people, you know, for studies that are smokers and they want to quit. And so we'll use some of these psychological tools um, to, to try to help people quit. Um, and one of the questions we always ask is, um, you know, do you have a romantic partner? Is that partner also a smoker? Um, and if the answer to those two things is yes, um, we won't even include that person in the study unless the, the partner also enrolls in the study. Because the, the rates of, especially, there's something about smoking, right? It, it's such a sort of pervasive lifestyle habit that if, if you are a smoker and your partner smokes, you, it's, it's essentially impossible for you to quit um, unless your partner is also quitting at the same time. It's just, it just never happens. So that can work both ways. 
Okay. We feel obligated to each other. What do we mean by that? It works best when we commit publicly, right? When we say out loud, particularly to a community of people that we care about, I'm going to change my behavior. You go on the record, there's a lot of reasons this works, right? We have this idea of, of credibility, right? You don't want to, if you tell people you're going to do something, you don't want to then not do it, even if it has no impact on them, because it, it affects your reputation, right? You want to be a, a truthful, trustworthy person. So here's just one example. There's actually many studies on this. Um, here's one example where these researchers had, uh, had college students commit publicly to, uh, to lose weight. So PC in this case, you see PC, this means public commitment. And what they had people do here was they had people go on, on social media, on Facebook, and, and just write a post saying, I am going to you know, lose this much weight. So um, they had no public commitment. There was a short-term public commitment, right, which was, I'm going to lose weight in the next month. And then there was a long-term public commitment, which is, I'm going to lose weight over the next four months. And then they just tracked, basically, how, what percentage of their goal do they complete, right? So I'm going to lose 10 pounds in the next month, and if I lost 9 pounds, well, then I would say, I've, I've achieved 90% of my goal. Right? So your higher bars are better, and they didn't only track it over 4 or 16 weeks, they tracked it all, all the way up to about 6 months. And it turns out that this effective public commitment was, was really strong. That when you publicly commit, and you publicly commit to, to, a, to stick to something for a long time, um, that, in this case, really helped people. So here, 97.46, right? Almost 100% almost of their goal was maintained six months after the initial commitment, right? Even when people said, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this for, for four months, which was really nice. Um, we feel obligated to each other, right? So here's this, what we're, we're calling pre-commitment. And so, actually, social media has made this quite, uh, quite easy. Um, it's pretty easy to go online and to, to go ahead and, you know, say something. And so, some people have started to build tools, online tools, to help people uh, to pre-commit. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about one of them, it's kind of neat. Um, but the, the idea here, or the, the psychological interpretation, is that going on the record, telling people that you're going to do something, um, adds some weight to that, right? It, it sort of forces you to, to stick to it, right? To stick to your word. Where's our other thing? All oh, right, social norms. I mentioned we care about social norms. Uh, here's a new stu newish study from a group of, of researchers at Columbia, I think, yes, um, who were interested in this idea of um, peer feedback. They want to know, you know, when you get information about what your peers think about, um, about something, in this case it's food, uh, so they were talking about, let's see, um, more feedback, less feedback. Wait, no, this is true. Um, so I think it's about healthy and unhealthy foods, in this case. And what they were looking at was this effect of um, adolescents and adults. And this is kind of a, a special, special case where uh, a group of psychologists was focusing in on people in a particular age range. This is adolescents here. The idea being that adolescents should be more susceptible to the social world compared to adults or actually even younger children. They don't, I don't, I'm not showing you those data, but they have younger children in here too. And the idea is that during adolescence, there's what scholars call a, a social reorientation. Adolescence is a time when you go from your primary peer group being your, your, your family, right? your parents and your siblings, if, if you have any, to when you enter adolescence, by the time you're through adolescence, your sort of primary peer reference group is other, other kids, right? So there's this big shift. Um, and psychologists right now, the, the, the thinking in the developmental psychology world is that this actually goes a long way to explaining a lot of the, you know, what we adults kind of consider the crazy behavior of adolescents. Um, sometimes it's sort of a byproduct of this fact that, that their social world changes so dramatically that the things that they value and the kinds of behaviors that they get rewarded for change, you know, pretty rapidly and so that they're, they're adjusting their behaviors accordingly. Anyway, I, I realize these plots are kind of complicated. What I'm showing you here are people that got feedback about what other adolescents or ad adults, right, their peers, thought about certain kinds of foods. Um, so the general experimental setup here is that they show people pictures of foods, they ask them how much they like the food, and then they tell them, actually, it turns out that other people who are like you like this food more than you do. 
or sometimes that would be uh, they more, that's the more condition. Less would be, oh, it turns out other people who are like you like these foods less than you do, right? Um, that's this less condition. Or the agree condition is sort of like, you know what, you, you're about average in terms of how much you like salad and how much you like hamantashen. And then the trick, the rub is a week later that they, they then have the adolescents come back and they uh, ask them again, how much do you like these things? How much do you like salad? How much do you like hamantashen? How much do you like you know, hamburgers? And what we're showing here is, what, what I'm showing you on this plot is the change in the preferences. Essentially, how much do your preferences change from the first time to the second time as a function of whether you learned about the feedback about your peers. And just as you'd expect, right, when you're told that other people like the food more, then your preferences increase a little bit, but they go up. When you're told other people like the food less than you do, your preferences decrease. Um, and I'm showing you, so what I'm showing here is just the overall change. This is sort of a zoom in on the change. And what was sort of surprising to this um, group of researchers was that they expected the adolescents to be completely susceptible to the peer influence. They said, well, if we tell teenagers that their friends like this thing, then they're going to go nuts for it, right? But of course, adults are more reasonable, and so adults won't change that much. But the kind of surprising fact was the adults changed too, not quite as much as the adolescents, but, but quite a bit, right? Um, and I think what they're showing you here is uh, change in preference in, in terms of dollars. One of the ways you can ask people about their preferences is by having them bid, right? You basically have this procedure where they pay for the food. Um, to economists like to call this, you reveal the preferences, right? It's sort of how much you pay for, or are willing to pay for something is an indicator of your sort of true preferences. Um, so here I think the idea is that adults are, are changing about 70 cents um, but they're, in terms of how much they're willing to pay for certain foods when they're told that other people like those foods as well. It's kind of nice. So, social world can be helpful, right? We learn by watching. When we see other people make mistakes, we learn from those mistakes, especially when we see ourselves as close to those people. When we publicly pre-commit um, to close or even not so close uh, others on social media, right? It's like, who knows who's on social media? Some of my friends, but then, you know, most of my friends are probably Russian bots. Nonetheless, right, this, this creates um, behavior change. And then you can have advantageous social norms, right? Learning what other people like has a pretty, can have a powerful influence on, on even adults. Even if there's no public option, I was telling, um, I've, I've presented these data before, one time I, I presented these data in front of uh, the president of our university, Michael Schill, and he came up afterwards and he said, well, in important context, Michael Schill is, um, he is in a con he's, he's in the school of law, so he's an attorney and he's a legal scholar and especially studies uh, law and economics. And so his comment didn't surprise me coming from somebody with that background, which was, I don't care about what other people think. Um, which, you know, he was being a little bit glib, but he said, I don't care about what other people think. I want to, you know, I want to know what things are worth, right? He's like, I don't really believe in this whole social world thing, social influence. He's like, what's the, you know, what is the dollar effect? And I said, well, even if you don't think public opinion would sway you, you can put your own money on the line. Um, and that can be just as effective. So I've added this, this kind of set of slides. You can pre-commit to your own pocketbook. If you don't think your social world, if you, know, if you don't think it's important to sort of follow through on your social commitments to people, like Michael Schill, well, you can, you know, you can pre-commit with your pocketbook. Um, and economists or behavioral economists have done these kinds of things. There are all these little websites now. This is one that I like. It's called stick, with two Ks, dot com. And you can go to stick.com, and the idea is, I want to commit to and then you select a goal, right? And they have common goals like exercise more or, you know, lose weight or, uh, you know, eat better, or quit smoking. And you say go. And once you say that goal, then you say, well, how much is it worth to you? Like literally in dollars, how much is it worth to you? Okay, well, you know, it would be worth $100 for me to lose whatever. And you say, okay, give us your credit card number. And you, know, you joke. They, so you give them your credit card number, they charge it. They take that money, they put it into an escrow account. And then you can set up different ways of basically what happens to that money. So you have to pick a, a, essentially a judge, an adjudicator. So you can have somebody that you nominate, presumably a friend or somebody that you trust, to say, 
you know, this person is going to be the judge. And if I don't follow through on this, this person's going to click no. Ellie didn't follow through. And that money, guess where that money goes? You pick a charity that you don't like, right? And so think about the cause that you hate the most, right? Think about the charity that would support that cause. And you say, okay, if I haven't lost nine pounds, you know, in a month or two months, then, you know, Natalie's going to say, you didn't do it, and then that hundred dollars is going to go to the NRA, right, or wherever you want, right, and so, they, and, and it's great, so I pointed Michael Schill to this, and he's like, ah, oh, that would work for me, <laughs> so I was like, okay, good, so if you're, you know, an attorney or an economist, and you don't care about social pressure, right, you can use money to actually follow through, so it's, it's a very effective commitment strategy, um, and of course, the, the business model for stick here is that when, you know, when that money goes, they, they take a cut. Right. You get your, all your money back if you stick to your goals, they get a cut only if you fail. And so their whole business model depends on people failing at their goal, but it's a smart business model. Okay, um, <laughs> so, um, and, and so we, there's, there's evidence about this. So I think this is um, a study on uh, saving, this was um, buying healthy food. Um, so this was a study done by a group of economists, and I think they were looking at people committing to purchasing healthier foods in, in the supermarket, um, with this idea being that, you know, it's really hard to change what you eat if it's right in front of you, right? Like, if, if the homotoxin are right there, that's sort of the worst situation from a goal pursuit perspective. If I, if I have a goal to eat healthier, that's like the impossible, you know, it's it's impossible task. It's a little bit easier to sort of take it one step back and say, you know what, if, if my goal is to eat more healthily, what you want to do is to stock your house with healthy food, right? Eliminate that option. If there's no unhealthy food in my cabinet, that's going to go a long way to changing my behavior. And so here their target was purchases in grocery stores. And they had people commit um, to, to purchase healthier foods with money, right? It's a group of economists. So they did a similar thing to how stick works. They had people put money into account. That was their way of committing. And then they tracked their behavior over the course of an entire year. Um, and the way they, they tracked this was actually quite clever. They had people turn in their grocery store receipts so they could see what people are buying right, for the whole year. Um, they had people who committed, they had people that were kind of didn't commit, that's sort of the control condition, it's like go, you know, go on your merry way and buy what you're going to buy. Um, and then in the control condition, they committed to doing something, um, they, they committed to doing something healthy, but not in terms of buying healthier foods. Um, and in either case, the idea here is even across the, the, the duration of the year, people stuck to this goal longer. In fact, it looks like the effect was even stronger in the back half of the year when they had committed. Um, presumably because they knew that they, were, you know, they would get their money back at the end of the year. So they started to remember that. Okay, um, let's see. What, what time do we have here? Oh, I think we're good. I'll tell you a little bit about this, um, these, these self-studies. So here this idea of resolutions or behavior change doesn't exist in isolation. It doesn't exist in terms of social isolation, right? We don't change our behavior as an individual person. It happens in a social context. But a behavior itself, even within the life of a person, isn't kind of disconnected from the rest of the, that person's life, right? The fact that, say, I want to change my eating sounds simple, right? It's like, well, I'm just going to eat less red meat and eat less sugar, right? And eat more green leafy vegetables. But if you really think about it, and this is kind of a deep idea in, in psychology, in social psychology, which is that Goals are sort of embedded in your broader self-concept, right? So things, habits can become pretty particular and pretty um, specific to an individual. So when I say, you know, well, I eat too much kind of high-fat foods, well, maybe that's because I really like bacon. And maybe, I know that's a bad thing to say. Uh, bacon's a bad example. Um, but, you know, okay, but I'll admit it, right? I like bacon. And why? Well, it's not just a thing that I do, right? It's not just a habit that exists in isolation. Bacon is connected to all these other things, right? I have good memories of eating bacon in the past, right? It's like a social thing. I, I, I associate it with certain people, with certain times in my life, with certain values even. This is especially true in terms of cultural influences on food, um, on eating, which is one kind of behavior that I focus on, because that's one of the things that I study. So I, um, I, I have a, an uncle 
who was born and raised in Los Angeles. We grew up there, but he married uh, a woman from Louisiana. He moved down um, to, to the bayou, essentially, in Louisiana. And there, uh, when I visit him down there, the, this idea that like certain kinds of behaviors are embedded within self-concept is really salient. Right? I thought I liked bacon before, but you go down to Louisiana, and it's like, they are a bacon people. It's like it defines who they are, right? Smoked meats, we know, is not a good, healthy thing. It can promote cancer. You know, smoked meats are carcinogenic. Smoking meats is like part of who they are, right? And so when you talk, when you talk to people down there about changing their eating habits, um, or even tobacco is another example, right? And alcohol, those are all like really powerfully embedded in their in their their system. I mean, it's not a stretch, I think, to say that for some people. Behavior change doesn't just require changing that particular behavior, but it requires changing your entire self-concept. Right? It requires changing completely the way you think about yourself as a person. That's hard. Right? Um, and this is true of smoking, too. This is one of the reasons cigarette smoking persists, even when the, the kind of physiological addiction to nicotine is addressed. You can have plenty of nicotine in your system, um, delivered through a patch or through gum, or through inhalers nowadays, much more than you would ever get from cigarettes. But smoking still persists, and one of the reasons is it's because it's such a it's such a cultural thing, right? People build their whole lives around smoking. You build your whole lives around when you take a break and who you hang out with, right? And the kinds of places you go to, right? Everything revolves around smoking, and so changing that behavior really implies changing your whole life. So we've tried to kind of lean into this idea. And to try to say, well, what are the, you know, you could think about goals, like quit smoking, um, but you can also think about sort of how they fit in, right? Where does it fit with the rest of the way you think of yourself? You can say, well, quitting smoking is something I want to do because I value health. And I value health because, you know, I want to be a healthy person. So what I'm showing you here is this idea of like a goal hierarchy. This is my, my colleague Chuck Carver in Miami talks about these goal hierarchies. And he says, well, you can arrange goals in, in these hierarchies where higher up in the hierarchy are, you're asking like why questions. So you get a broad, abstract, ideal things, but to move up, you ask the question why, right? I want to exercise, well, why? Well, because I have a goal, you know, to, to exercise, well, why, right? Well, I want to exercise because I want to be fit. Well, why? Right? Why do I want to be fit? Right? You can keep going. Ultimately, one of the cool insights that Chuck Carver has had is, essentially, at the end of the day, the answer to, to the biggest why questions usually revolve around some kind of ideal vision of ourself that we have. Right? Ultimately, the answer to the why question, behind goals at least, is, well, because I have this vision of who I want to be, right? and that's what's going to help me attain it. On the other hand, you can ask questions about going down this hierarchy, and you ask the question, how, right? Well, I want to quit, you know, I value being healthy, so how can I be healthy? Well, I could quit smoking. How could I quit smoking? Well, I could buy the patch, right? Well, how do I do that? And right, ultimately, essentially, you go down and down until you get to like very low-level motor behaviors, and always the lowest level comes down to, well, I pull out my wallet, right? That's always the lowest level of whatever, anything you have here, right, it's going to come down to buying something. Um, but this is kind of a deep idea because it gets to these two modes of thinking that are both pretty integral. The how, the lower levels, really engage with this question of the, the mechanisms, the, the mechanics, right? What exact behaviors do I need to engage in? The higher levels deal with the kind of more abstract but also equally important ideas of, of motivation, right? It's sort of like, well, why do I want to do these things in the first place? What motivates me? And it's, uh, it's pretty useful. And we've started to think about, oh yeah, so Chuck would call these sort of like B goals, right? What kind of person do I want to be? Do goals, and then the lowest level are like actions, right? Specific actions that you would take. So we've started to do some studies that revolve around this idea. We've had a few insights. One of them is that when you think about the kind of person you want to be, when you think about those highest level goals, we see activation in this part of the brain here called the medial prefrontal cortex. So what you're looking at is the, a sort of a side view of a brain. So if I were to sort of cut my head open here, not to get too graphic, um, but you know, like if you were looking at my brain from this side, 
It's sort of right here in the middle, kind of just above my eyeballs. That's the medial prefrontal cortex. That's, um, so when you think about your ideal self, that's what you see in red. There's other parts of the brain that are involved too, but most of them are on this, what we would call the medial or the middle uh, kind of central line of the brain here. When you think about value, not just core values, but also actually monetary value, right? When I ask you, how much are you willing to pay for, you know, that home in this same part of the region uh, of the brain is active, which is actually a pretty weird overlap if, at first, if you think about it, there's quite a bit of overlap, all the yellow. But the more we thought about it, the more we learned, hey, wait a second, these are the same regions of the brain that are involved in habit formation to begin with, right? When you get rewarded for something, when you're placing a value on something, when you're expecting an outcome, usually a positive outcome, like in, you know, if you, if you tell somebody they're going to get some kind of reward, these are the, the brain regions that are active. Because these are the regions that are sort of feeding into that, to those dopamine structures down here at the very beginning of the talk I told you about habit, the habit system and the basal ganglia. That's under here. So these regions kind of feed into there. And for us, this was one of these powerful kind of aha moments. It's like just in the same way that money and drugs and food can be reinforcing, right, because they activate these dopamine structures, so can Things like ideal goals, right? core values, things like cherished core values that we think about and care about. Um, and, and so we've started to develop interventions where the reward becomes, instead of money or food or something like that, the reward becomes giving people feedback that they're living up to their ideal self, or that they, it gives them a path, at least, to, lead, to live up to their ideal self. And that can be pretty powerfully rewarding and we're starting to show how that, that can generate behavior change. But I think, um, I think I'll, I'll stop there. It feels like that's probably enough content. Um, but I'm happy to just stick around and let's you know, chat about that. Have questions. So thank you guys for your attention and for the conversation. And I would be remiss. I want to at least show you, I won't get to everything, but let me show you a picture of my lab group here. Because these are the people that do a lot of the work. Um, so here I am standing in the, the Lewis Integrative Sciences building on the UO campus. It's a beautiful building. If you're ever uh, around, you should come and stop by. It's sort of on the corner of Franklin and Agate. And uh, yeah, so the folks doing that work that I just told you about, I'll see are sort of back here. These are graduate students. This, uh, this one is named Lauren Kahn, Rita Ludwig. Um, this is Jordan Livingston and Danny Cosma, are the, the kind of key people involved in that study. Um, but, all right, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Professor Elliot Berkman. Um, this is a fascinating talk, and since it seems like people were, shy, uh, were a little shy, I will ask a few lead questions. And then uh, there's a microphone sung up oh, in Jody's hand. Excellent for follow up questions. So, one of the first questions that came up to me, when you mentioned the basal ganglia, you made, I'm not sure how much of an aside it was that it's one of the oldest parts of our brain. I, as a rabbi, I'm really interested in ancient wisdom. So I, like, I wonder if there's something you make of that that you could flesh out. Um, and, and more recently, you were talking about activity in the prefrontal cortex, which is newer, right? So is there significance to, Thing, habits or way, neural connections that have been going on among animals for relatively much longer than, than other neural connections. And my other question, and maybe this is beyond the scope of what you think about, you, you spoke about sort of the tensions of your field focusing on the individual and then focusing on the individual in the context of the social group. Um, what about when the whole social group has a psychological problem that needs to shift? You know, whether that's the self-conception that we eat bacon in Louisiana, um, or, you know, the self-conception that we should all be striving for endless growth, wealth, and consumerism, you know, like, we, there are a lot of unhealthy um, societal norms that it can be much harder, as, very hard as an individual to shift out of because we're not 
getting reinforcement from the culture around us that we should be shifting. Do you, do you have any insights from your work about how, how we address those? Yeah, those are good questions. Thanks. I'll think, yeah, I don't know if I can answer them adequately. Um, well, in terms of, so what you mentioned was in terms of ancient wisdom, one thing I did want to say about the basal ganglia and habits is that um, it's always, as somebody that studies habits, um, I, I've always been fascinated at the role of ritual in religion, in every religion that I'm aware of, but I mean, Judaism is the one I'm most familiar with. Um, that, that it's interesting that so much of the day-to-day -day practice of Judaism can come down to ritual and habits, essentially, and that to me that, that's never been an accident, right? To me that's sort of like the reason, you know, we're, we're, you could say, obsessive about counting things and doing the same thing every time, right? Every time you enter a building, you do this thing, right? Every time you wake up, you do this thing. Every time you put something into your mouth, you do this thing, right? It becomes, and, and we're not alone, right? Many religions have similar kinds of habits. And, and I think thinking about it in, in that terms of like, just like we, we were reading right at the very outset in the Midrash, this idea that behavior can become kind of channeled, right, if you repeat it, and if it gets reinforced. And so I think there is the ancient wisdom there is that these are powerful brain structures, right? It's the kinds of structures that lower order creatures or, you know, creatures at least with smaller brains, you know, it's sort of the only kind of behavior they can engage in is habitual behavior. And there's something sort of kind of deep about that in nature, that a lot of, of animals can sort of get along just fine living their lives. They don't have problems with addiction, right? They don't have problems with cons rampant consumerism. Right? A lot of animals are like, no, we're, we're adapted to our environment and we're doing just fine. And so some, some of the kind of power of ritual is into helping us form those pathways. And especially if you can get onto sort of a good pathway you know, there's, you don't really need to think very deeply um, about every little thing that you do. Um, so, actually, I, I like this quote from, from Zen Buddhism, actually, this idea of, like, does the dog have the Buddha nature? And the answer is yes, right? The dog has the Buddha nature. And part of it is because the dog is not self-conscious, essentially. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. But, but a lot of it comes down to the fact that the dog is not thinking about what happened yesterday or what the dog is going to do tomorrow, right? The dog is just right, living in the moment. And what enables that is, is the kind of the habit system, right? The dog is sort of driven by the environment in certain powerful ways and, and is okay with that. And then, yeah, your second question about like, well, what happens when an entire group of people, a society kind of gets on a, a, a bad path? That's a pretty profound question. There are people in psychology that study exactly this idea of, of sort of group, uh, group dynamics right, in our field, and, and that would be within the field of social psychology as well. And one of the interesting kind of dialectic tensions there is in that psychology, and maybe you picked up on it even in what I was saying, is this idea of, on the one hand, we really want to fit in with the group. It's really important to us to fit in and to, to conform, right? We call that conformity. And so in social psychology, we'll, we'll study funny little examples like, well, why all of a sudden, like what happens with fashion trends, right? Why all of a sudden people used to wear jeans and now everybody wears leggings, right? Or, you know, all of a sudden everybody is cuffing up their jeans or something like that. The little, especially if you're on campus every day, you notice these trends, or I notice these trends because I'm sort of outside of them, but I'm like, it, it feels like, oh, we just went off to break and we came back and everybody's different like that. So it's powerful. We really want to conform. But on the other hand, we don't want to be identical. In fact, we also have a strong motive to kind of differentiate ourselves from the crowd. Right? We want to feel like an individual and you want to feel uh, different and special in certain ways. And this is a pretty interesting tension that runs throughout social psychology. And, and it's one of these... Um, kind of like uh, group dynamic questions is like how do trends start and often they have to start with one person being an outlier right trends have to start with one person doing something and then at some point it, it catches on right and it spreads through the social network um, and, and it can spread really quickly and that 
kind of interesting dialectic of like when is it good to fit in versus when is it good to be that unique weirdo, right? And when do you become a trendsetter um, is a really big question in psychology that we don't fully have answers to. But I think my answer to that would be, you know, we need to be an example. And again, that's something that I think is, is interesting in Judaism, right? I think whenever I'm sitting and, and kind of participating, one of the things that, that often strikes me is like, wow, a lot, of, a lot of the kind of Jewish teaching revolves around that idea of, you know, being a shining light or being an example for other nations. That even when the whole world feels like it's going off track, that it's sort of our, we've been commanded to, to kind of set a, an example. And in some ways, that you could interpret that as sort of like, well, that, that's telling us to go against the trend and be the outlier and kind of take the leap of faith that once you start doing that, then that can get the ball rolling. Have you guys seen the John Hughes movie, um, Can't Buy Me Love? There's like this famous, it's like an 80s movie, so I don't know. There's this famous scene, and it's like a high school dance, and this one kid has decided he's going to come up with this new dance, and he starts doing this crazy dance on the dance floor. And at first, everybody is looking at him, and there's like one, you know, cut to one scene, and the guy says, "Oh, he must be from Special Ed, right?" But then, like a couple of other guy, a couple of other sort of trendsetting people start imitating him, and then before long, the whole group is doing it. So whenever I teach social psychology, I show that, that clip from that movie because it, it like perfectly demonstrates that how things sort of spread through the crowd. Yeah. I'll yeah, thanks for a very nice lecture. Um, can you comment a bit about the relationship between uh, a decision and a habit? Uh, I, for a long time, have been part of a group that gets up and runs early in the morning, and sometimes the weather isn't very good as it has been. I uh, was running the other day when, in cold weather, and my friend said, you know, uh, I had a hard time deciding to run this morning. And so I told him, well, the problem is, is you should say, not have this be a decision, you should just say, this is a habit, I do it, and, and take it out of the realm of a decision. Maybe this is like your instant habit. Does that make sense to you? It does. <clears throat> yeah, it does. I mean, in the, in the neuroscience world, this has been a, a, a confounding problem, right? Because if you, if you just observe behavior, Right, you see, okay, well, somebody did something. Somebody went running, right? You can't tell what prompted that to happen, right? I mean, maybe you can ask the person, but from, from a neuroscience perspective, there does seem to be these sort of, they talk about it, um, I mean, they might call it uh, rule-based versus rule-free, you know, behavior, but the, yes, the idea is there's a distinction between habits, which don't really count as a decision. They're just sort of something you do or without thinking, versus a decision, with a, which I think classically is thought of as something that's a little bit more deliberate, and in fact does use different brain systems. So that's actually been an interesting way that neuroscience has kind of weighed in on this debate by saying, no, look, the brain is different when you engage in a habit versus deciding to do something. It comes up in the goal and self-control literature too, because some people say, actually with the running example, which is like you can look at, at athletes and say, wow, they must have amazing self-control. Right? And other people are like, no, it's actually, no, it doesn't count as self-control because it's not hard, right? It's not hard for them. They do it automatically. Um, and so that, that's still sort of a debate. You know, some of it comes down to semantics, but, you know, is it the same thing when an Olympian wakes up at 4 a.m. and goes for a 20-mile run, right? Because that's what that person does six out of seven days a week, you know, 50 weeks a year. Versus when somebody who never runs, you know, sets the alarm and decides to go, you know, and because the behavior might be the same, right, but what, what's kind of motivating behind it is quite different. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hello there. Uh, Hi. Thanks for, for being here tonight. This has sure. been fascinating. Uh, and you are the perfect person to ask this question. I've always been fascinated by the uh, role that music plays in forming habits. Uh, it's very prominent in, in uh, religious music mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, art tropes and, and uh, it's advertisers have known it for ages and ages that jingles and stuff sell mm -hmm. things and, and uh, rock and roll will uh, actually catch kids' attention and change whole lives and whole attitudes. How does this how does music fit in with forming habits? 
that's a that's a, a cool question. I mean, it's I, on the one hand, my first thought is when you're learning music. I mean, that's habit formation, right? Even just sort of learning the mechanics of, say, playing the piano, learning songs. Um, yeah, I mean, so that that is a habit because I think at some point when you get to a certain level of sophistication, it's too hard to really think about every little movement that you're making with your hands, right? It has to be habit formation. Um, and then in terms of like listening to music, as you noted, right, I think music is really powerful because, um, well, on the one hand, the, our auditory cortex has some sort of pretty cool projections, specific projections into the reward center. So we can associate sounds and music counts, right, um, with behaviors with people with sets of attitudes and beliefs so it's easy to sort of form that that, that kind of pair and as you said advertisers will use that to their advantage right advertisers will use the fact that well when you hear the rolling stones you have a certain set of associations that come to mind automatically because you formed those associations and then they want to like well we want you to pair that set of good things and good feelings with our product right like I literally saw an advertisement for Mercedes-Benz, did you see this? With the Janis Joplin song, you know, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes-Benz, which of course is mocking consumerism, but they were using it and I was like, what's going on? <laughs> how did it happen? Yeah. So, so cool tunes help reward systems Right. Make, make. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, tunes that you think are rewarding, um, right? And so that's, that's the key. But yeah, you can pair, you know, this good thing, with happiness, and then you can sort of now associate this good thing with our product. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. This is um, following up on what Paul was saying about running. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's this experience that's very common that when you start out running, it really takes a lot of effort to get up every day to do it. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, and some people say 28 days or whatever, right. um, it might be endorphins, it might be something, but it's like, it's something you want to do, it's something that you're sort of driven to do. And how does that fit with what we're talking about? Yeah, um, well, I mean, some of it is, it is habit formation, right? It's habit learning. Once you've done something enough times, yeah, 28 days, I've heard that number, I mean, there's no hard and fast rule. Um, it's similar with the 10,000 hours rule of learning music, maybe you've heard that if you do something for 10,000 hours, Right. Um, but, you know, yes, once you've done something enough times, it becomes rewarding. And it's true that exercise does release these endogenous, and you know, opioids, essentially, endorphins. Um, and so it can feel good for that reason. Yeah, I, I, it, that's always been a puzzle, to be honest, because habits, um, they're... The, the, the way the habit learning system works is that it doesn't necessarily rely on sort of continued reinforcement once you learn the habit. It needs to get reinforced every once in a while, but it doesn't necessarily need to feel good. Um, in fact, that's one of the things that goes wrong in, in drug use, and particularly opioids, right? This idea that basically your, your brain expects the opioids to feel good, but they, they don't actually, right? They don't quite feel as good as you expect them to. Um, and yet the behavior persists, right? So it's almost the opposite of what happens with, with running, which is like, we expect it to feel bad and it feels good. Um, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, David. Thank you. I have a question about the public commitment. And uh, this is something that I bump into here and there where the commitment is actually required from the outsiders. So let's say you you want to sign up for a self-improvement class, but you don't have the money to do it. So you're asking your friends and people that you know to put up money to do that. Any thoughts about the effects on the people around you, on yourself? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think the effects on yourself, if you're asking your friends to, to put up money, and they do, I mean, that, that certainly would be a form of a public commitment. So I would expect that to promote behavior change, at least in that person. Yeah, how would it affect the friends? I'm not sure. Um, that's a good question, because what, what do you have? It's complicated. I mean, you'd have the sort of financial obligation. It probably feels weird if the person doesn't, because then, you know, we don't like it when, when, we don't like sort of entangling different levels of friendship, right? Sort of financial transactions versus friend transactions. That's, we, we don't like mixing those kinds of things. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> 
Oh, last question. Okay. For someone who's addicted to drugs, do any of these methodologies work effectively uh, considering the depth of their emotional, physical involvement with the drug? That's a good question. Um, so the, yeah, this question of does it work? I mean, for certain drugs, it works. So I think um, I, one of the reasons I focus on, on nicotine and tobacco use is because it, it's a that's an interesting drug because nicotine is very powerfully addictive, but even when people have pharmacological nicotine replacement, so patch or gum, they still engage in the behavior. So in some ways, nicotine is almost like, you could call it like a pure behavioral addiction, right? That there's something about just doing this that's even not at the level of the brain that's reinforcing neurochemically. And so for, for nicotine, these, these things work pretty well. Um, and alcohol as well. Um, a lot of alcohol treatments are revolve around commitment and um, what one is, is they call contingency management, <clears throat> where essentially you, you get paid to be abstinent. The big exception is opioids. Um, the opioid epidemic, one of the reasons that it's been so devastating and so uh, kind of confounding to public health officials is because um, those opioids and especially the prescription ones that pharmaceutical companies are manufacturing, it acts directly on those brain systems that are involved in the habit formation system. So, and they, they damage it. So it becomes, you know, and pretty quickly. So at some point you're, you, essentially the opioids will destroy your ability to form new habits. And so any, anything that I've talked about that is based around essentially the kind of fundamental assumption that, well, our brain, you know, works in this way, right? It responds to reward, rewards in this way, and if you reward behaviors, then they're more likely to happen in the future. Pretty, you know, general rules that, that are true, even if you're addicted to nicotine, even if you're addicted to alcohol, um, even if you're addicted to uh, cannabis, doesn't hold for opioids because they act directly on those brain systems. And so that's, that's a really, you know, as we know, we're pretty devastating. Uh, Addiction. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I wish we had a better answer. <laughs> Hold on, that's, yeah. All right, thank you guys. Professor Elliot Bergman, despite the many, many hours I've been awake, I did not feel tempted to fall asleep at any point in your presentation. And I really appreciate you know, how you weaved in so many strands of religion, Judaism, as well as your own research into your comments. Um, that was like icing on the cake. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you all for being here. Our next and final um, installment of scientists in synagogues this year is going to be Dr. Gerard Saucier, uh, April 10th. And Paul, do we have a topic? Yeah, he's writing the uh, perpetrators genocide. Why, uh, what causes them to lead to apostles? Okay, not a cheerful topic, but an unfortunately relevant and fascinating topic. How does one become, how and why does one become a perpetrator of genocide and mass atrocity? Uh, thank you again, Professor Elliot.